So our second um, plenary speaker for this morning is someone uh, that we've had the pleasure of having here in North Carolina with us for um, a few years now, Dr. Greg Gray. Uh, Dr. Gray is a professor at Duke University, and he has uh, three affiliations, the Division of Infectious Diseases in Duke University School of Medicine, the Duke Global Health Institute, um, and the Duke Nicholas School of the Environment. And Dr. Gray is a part-time professor in the program of emerging infectious diseases at the Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore and a professor of uh, global health at the Duke Kunshan University in China. He manages research teams in each of these institutions. Uh, Dr. Gray's medical boards are in preventive medicine and public health. He's conducted diverse epidemiological studies of infectious diseases uh, for 25 years on five continents and authored more than 300 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters. Much of his work has been involved with identifying risk factors for occupational diseases, particularly for respiratory viruses. Uh, he studied numerous occupational groups, including farmers, animal breeders, veterinarians, military personnel, poultry workers, horse workers, hunters, and pig workers. And uh, we're very fortunate to have him. I learned last night that he's leaving right after for his daughter's wedding in Texas, so we're glad that he's here with us today. So uh, welcome, Dr. Gray. Well, thanks, uh, Zach, and it's an honor to be here. And I hope I give you some things to think about that perhaps are a little new. First, let me just state up front that we live in some extremely challenging times in public health. Uh, some of that is driven by modern transportation, uh, where we can move people, animals, and products around the world extremely rapidly now. And that's only amplifying some of the problems that we face uh, uh, such as emerging infectious diseases, where many of these pathogens that cause problems in man are reservoired in animals, and some of these uh, animals have no signs or symptoms. And so trying to mitigate some of these problems is extremely exasperating because we have to find cooperation across disciplines, often in, among animal uh, industries. So this is a complex problem that we perhaps didn't face, at least to the same extent, some 30 years ago. Another very complex or wicked problem is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, these, as, as you heard from Dr. Perlman, these are uh, looming on the horizon to uh, just cause us a tremendous calamity in our healthcare setting, settings. Um, uh, and when you think about the complexities here, of the pressures on the organisms to uh, be selected, you can see that we just can't uh, focus on our, our hospitals or our clinical care systems. We have to, again, work with uh, animal agricultural industries. We have to work with environmental health professionals uh, who can look at the metabolites, for instance, in the water for um, uh, some of the, some of the um, antibiotics that we use. So again, a complex area. And despite all our advances uh, in technology, the land grant universities that help us produce food, and perhaps the safest food in the world, we continue to have foodborne outbreak um, uh, that, uh, that plague us. And it's not so much uh, the, the problems, I, I would say, uh, uh, in, of the industry, it's that the food products are extremely complex now. There are many different components and many different opportunities for incursions uh, of toxins or microbes to enter. And so we, we again need to work if we're in hope of being more than a response entity, we have to find ways to partner with the um, food production industries. Well, with these complex problems, uh, we're not set up to handle them. There's no one person or discipline that's trained to engage across all these disciplines or often international boundaries. There's no one agency or organization that has authority uh, to call into um, performance the many entities involved. And so in a nutshell, it looks something like this. This is sort of my diagram for food safety. 
four different federal agencies with some sort of food safety responsibility. And they don't always work together. They're like fighting brothers. No, you cannot have my data. No, you cannot contact that company. That's proprietary. And it's just, frankly, dysfunctional. Now, fortunately, when we have a, a tremendous uh, frightening event, they, they come to the dinner table and they work it out. But one day, we're not going to have the leisure of such time. And one day, it's going to overwhelm us. So I'm going to challenge you to think about engaging perhaps in some new ways and especially finding ways uh, to work with the agricultural industry such that we're not the threat we are today. When you think about it in uh, public health, we have pretty darn good connections, I think, with veterinary health now. Uh, many different veterinarians are in the room. Uh, you, uh, you help us uh, so much, and we, we know about uh, your focus. We also are getting better and better, as uh, Dr. Pearl mentioned, that uh, with working with environmental health, learning about all the, uh, all the different uh, talents that you bring to bear and the equipment. But again, where we're lacking is agricultural health connections. I mean, where is Smithfield Farms? It's, head, it's headquartered here. How many people are associated with Smithfield Farms in the audience? Or Purdue Farms? Or the big beef industries? And yet, uh, you know, they're part and parcel with some of these complex problems that we face today. So many people think the way forward is to embrace this concept of One Health. I like this definition here. There are multiple definitions. Uh, but this AVMA definition, I think, is pretty succinct. It's a collaborative effort of multiple disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally to obtain optimal health for people, animals, and the environment. And I'd like to say, in, in addition to uh, veterinary health, human health, and, and environmental health, we've got to get the industry in here. We've got to find ways such that we're not a threat to the industry. In fact, we're, we're problem solvers. It's going to, so I'm going to hope to pitch some ideas on how that might come to fruition. First, let me just put out a plug for One Health. It's getting a lot of traction. This is simply a web search we did uh, comparing the counts from August 2016 to September 2018. 70% increase in web hits. Many of these are academic institutions, but some are professional institutions uh, like, uh, uh, you know, C CTSD. We're also seeing tremendous publications increases associated with One Health. In this review paper, the authors reported a 14.6% increase per year, and they said it was the fastest growing um, subdiscipline, or one of the fastest, uh, in biology. We're seeing journals, many journals now, uh, embracing One Health. Some of these are online, some are paper, some are both. But the idea is that they see opportunities to uh, benefit on One Health activities. Most importantly, we're seeing a lot of funding. If you, you can replicate this search, but simply I put in the keywords One Health into grants.gov, and from 2007 uh, to September 2018, we have, I found basically $4.8 billion and associated calls for proposals. Some of these very active. We're seeing One Health conferences. Many of these are local, some are state, some are regional, some are national, and some are international, where scientists from various different disciplines can come and get together and talk about uh, the common problems and working together in a One Health way. We're seeing the World Bank embrace One Health because these complex problems cost money. They cost money with respect to tourism and commerce. They're very, very disruptive. And so getting ahead of these with a One Health approach is, is an economic advantage. We're seeing the government embrace One Health. This is an antimicrobial resistance strategy from the Obama administration, followed by the, uh, uh, the Trump administration's embracement of a similar policy at the G20 meetings. Uh, One Health is key to fighting antimicrobial resistance. Well, how do we get professionals from different disciplines to work together in a One Health way? Well, I think it begins with our professional training. 
And I'll tell you that uh, a number of institutions have stood up, like we did at the University of Florida some five, six years ago, uh, PhD programs with a concentration in One Health. We, we had the first in the world, the first master's program in the U.S. with, with a concentration in One Health, and short courses like we're giving this week to a number of different scholars about One Health. I'll tell you that these graduates are finding advantages in having formal training in One Health or formal experience in One Health because it sets them apart. And we just recently um, uh, placed, I think, four postdocs in junior assistant professorship positions, and I have to think that a lot of it has to do with their One Health experience. We're seeing universities like Texas A&M come up with some novel ideas. Their senior administrators said, well, let's do an internal grant to bring our faculty together across various different uh, colleges, and let's see what happens. And I don't remember the exact counts, but I remember there's something, something like 23 proposals that overwhelmed them. They didn't have enough money, and, and they were re remarkably innovative, bringing together the engineers and the, and the modelers uh, with, the, with the health sectors. Uh, this is a, a very interesting thing I had the privilege of being engaged with. This is Lincoln University in, in Appalachia. They had a two-day leadership workshop uh, involving some 1,200 people discussing One Health and, and training junior uh, professionals and, and how we could work together on some of these complex problems. Here's our course. Uh, we've, in our 12th year or so, uh, uh, we focus on One Health. We take advantage of a lot of the scholars here in the uh, Raleigh-Durham area. Uh, we've had 20-some faculty introducing the various different disciplines because I don't know about you, but in medical school, I know next to nothing about entomology, food safety, aquaculture. And if you don't know about what these other disciplines can bring to the table, then you don't have a good portfolio to draw from for complex problem solving. We've also been privileged uh, to uh, win funding from the NIH to train professionals. Here we have uh, two years of training offered to Mongolian scholars and American scholars uh, with the goal of uh, trying to develop research projects to mitigate some of the zoonotic disease problems uh, that they face in Mongolia. And this was very successful uh, to, to our, our U.S. scholars and that they learned to live across cultures and, and to tackle some uh, interesting uh, projects. So those are some ideas. I'm sure there are more that we could discuss. Well, how do we apply One Health approaches to uh, research efforts? I can tell you what we do, and, and we're, we're rather focused, but certainly other groups have other portfolios. We're about 30 people uh, studying 30 pathogens under 30 projects in 11 countries. And we have laboratories in the Duke system uh, that, that we manage uh, here in, in uh, Duke, uh, in North Carolina, in Kunshan, China, and also in Singapore. So we have these bases to work and to network in, in various different academic and international settings in, in neighboring countries. And we work often at the human-animal nexus studying known zoonotic pathogens or looking for new pathogens and trying to anticipate uh, what would be the next pandemic threat before it adapts and is highly transmissible. We go where people and animals mix. And often the most animals uh, and the most uh, people are mixing uh, in association with domestic animal husbandry, such as uh, poultry and pigs. And we embrace thinking, like you see at the Gates Foundation, that the biggest threat is, are, are those uh, threats due to respiratory diseases and that they can move so quickly and overwhelm us so quickly. So we focus quite a bit on things that you know well, uh, the enterovirus, the hand, foot, and mouth disease, uh, uh, the killer cold viruses, the adenoviruses, all the, of course, the flu A's and, and B's, but also C and D, and coronavirus, uh, coronaviruses. We basically reached out to our veterinary partners and said, well, uh, given that the diagnostics used in the hospital setting are, are tuned in to, to pick up known uh, coronaviruses, adenoviruses, enteroviruses, how would we pick up animal viruses? And the answer is you wouldn't because those diagnostics would often miss a very novel agent. And so we have adapted in algorithms, uh, some of it uh, real-time PCR, some of it conventional PCR with sequencing, strategies to pick those up. 
uh, and much of this work is by partnering with the veterinarians. We've taught these strategies and workshops to partners in various different settings and helped them design their own uh, studies to look for novel agents that might be affecting their populations and their animals. Uh, and we focus a lot on where we see growth in the domestic animal production, and that is in pigs, in poultry, and in eggs. We work closely with veterinarians overseas because we get pushback from the industry here because we're seen as the enemy. We're seen as what costs them uh, business uh, dollars, and we've got to fix that because we have such a rich opportunity to study here, but it's, it's difficult. We bring in new technology to developing countries, uh, technology we see in the healthcare setting, environmental health and veterinary health. We partner with them and we give them uh, primers and probes to do things. And we get to see a lot of exciting uh, venues, if you will, where they think they're going to see an emerging threat. Uh, and so it's a rich experience professionally for those of us in uh, public health, infectious disease epidemiology, uh, and it's wonderfully rich with respect to uh, meeting friends from different cultures. Some of the things that we observe are the poor biosecurity uh, in the developing world. Here in China, they have embraced and purchased Smithfield Farms, the biggest uh, pork producer, and they've embraced uh, ways to cut uh, costs through uh, very carefully producing uh, good feed, and et cetera, but they haven't always embraced biosecurity. So you see venues like this where it's very easy for the chickens right next to the uh, pig uh, barn uh, to move avian virus or, or the dog or the ducks and the geese that are co-located. We see very poor use of personal protective equipment. So those workers are bringing whatever the pigs uh, have on their oral secretions home with them. So it's a real setup for uh, mixing of viruses. Now, how do you work with the animal industry? You know, uh, those of us in public health are not excited about us coming in there and sampling their animals. We could, we could cause harm to the animals, not only biosecurity harm, but also physical harm, and their animals might not be sold. So we've uh, gained a lot of help from NIOSH. Uh, Dr. Bill Lindsay, in fact, has loaned us, a, uh, I don't know, several dozen of these two-stage uh, samplers and gained a lot of knowledge from uh, progressive universities and public health departments like University of Minnesota, where they've been using these aerosol samplers to detect at least uh, viral and, and bacterial uh, nucleic acid in the air and sometimes live viruses. And we've been able to take these in various different clinical settings and animal production settings, uh, been able to detect things that we couldn't have easily detected by sampling individual animals. And even uh, lately in airports, such as RDU here, uh, found evidence of uh, various respiratory pathogens. And most recently, uh, we've sent our people riding the subways in Singapore. A very novel approach. Uh, yeah, there's no IRB required. I mean, we pass it through the IRB, but our, um, our uh, trainees uh, basically carried the aerosol samplers in a backpack with a sign on the morning, in the mornings and in the evenings and some of the busiest routes in, in all of Singapore and detected respiratory pathogens, suggesting that uh, transmission can occur in these crowded settings. We've also been privileged to bring in some new technology to bear in some of these uh, uh, human-animal connections. This is uh, Endeavor's um, uh, new uh, DNA chip, uh, and assuming it's, it's just, I think, uh, recently been approved by the FDA for some clinical use. And their, pro their, uh, their goal is to give us a complete, a pretty good picture on uh, influenza A and B uh, characterization in about eight hours, whereas in, in the past this might take uh, quite a few days uh, and even weeks uh, to, to do all the required sequencing work. So perhaps this can be used um, in, in one day, not only in the clinical human setting, but in an agricultural setting, so they would know when they had an incursion of a novel virus. Also exciting, I think, are what's going on with respect to Zucker, Zuckerberg's initiatives. Uh, they have developed a, a new strategy where they would, pace, they would place these toaster-sized deep sequencers throughout the developing world. Uh, these are relatively inexpensive, and they would teach uh, developing world scientists 
to use these and follow certain algorithms such that they could have a sequencing uh, network uh, in various different uh, healthcare settings to look for novel agents. The data goes up into the cloud where a large team of bioinformatics experts uh, pass the data uh, through a, um, a flow system, of, uh, a software flow system, and I'll show you some of the results here. This is work from Dr. Bailey, a postdoc in our group, where she got samples from farms in North Carolina, extracted the nucleic acid, and submitted them to this IDC. And basically, you get a microbiological textbook output of whatever's in there, bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, and uh, they have a discriminatory indexes to tell you the relative amounts of nucleic acid. You don't really know if it's, if it's live. But you can drill down uh, and uh, rapidly do an assessment with respect to what are the pathogens there. So we benchmarked this against some um, diagnostics for, that were very targeted, and it looked really well. And not only, it, not only did it match very well our, our targeted pathogens, uh, but it, it indicated through these fan-shaped um, uh, displays that maybe we'd picked up some new pathogens in this setting. So can you imagine how exciting this would be to use in, in biofilms in the hospital, uh, to use in uh, fevers of unknown uh, origin in the hospital or in the outpatient setting? It's very exciting work, and uh, it, it doesn't eliminate the bioinformatics experts. You'll eventually need those, but it gives you a rapid look at what's in a specimen. Well, what pathogens should we both be uh, mostly be concerned with? That's a difficult question. I think we focus mostly on the influenza viruses, and not only A and B, but also C and D, which I think is uh, D is, uh, there's a lot more to learn about it. And we know uh, from graphics like this, where humans and pigs uh, are easily infected with all four of these, uh, that uh, it gives us uh, pause to think, well, maybe we need to focus quite a bit at the human-pig interface. Uh, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of effort doing surveillance where it's not needed, and so finding the appropriate targets uh, is, is a good strategy. We, well, we might look also at influenza A viruses that are circulating in horses. These cause big epizootics in horses, and uh, especially where there's a dense populations of horses. We know that these occasionally infect man, but generally, even in challenge studies, these infections are rather mild. And we've looked really hard, and they seem to be also be very infrequent. So I wouldn't spend a tremendous amount of time in that. Perhaps some of the pandemics in the late 1800s were due to uh, equine influenza A, but I'm not putting a lot of money on that. Also, you might know that equine uh, influenza viruses moved to dogs and caused big epizootics here in the United States and in other countries. But where we see most of our problem are where they have uh, dog factory farms for food, such as in South Korea and Vietnam and China. And they have enough population to sustain the viruses where they can mix and cause different uh, problems. Colin Parrish at Cornell has done a lot of work at, uh, the, among uh, uh, canine influenza, and he reports that we just don't have dense populations of dogs uh, to sustain uh, epizootics. So what we see are rolling outbreaks uh, often associated with animal shelters. So and we've done serologic studies and, and found some mild evidence, but nothing, nothing extremely compelling. What about canine influenza? Uh, maybe you, you don't know, but the feline species have been infected with a number of different influenzas that are reservoir in other animals, dogs, uh, birds. And most recently, we've seen some infections in people associated with the shelter outbreak of an avian like uh, H7N2 uh, in New York. So we need to keep, be concerned about that. But again, they just don't have the dense populations except for these shelters. Uh, and it's certainly there are not enough animals there to have a, a long term uh, epizootic. Where we put most of our surveillance efforts has uh, perhaps rightfully been uh, so been in avian influenza. And we, we, you know, our interest in this began in 1997 where we saw the first crossover infections with H5N1. And since that time, we've seen many more different influenza types cross over to man. And our focus in recent years has chiefly been on H5 and H7N9 pathogens. Uh, but the species barrier here 
seems to be incredibly high in that we see people that are intensely exposed to poultry like this in Vietnam, a wholesale market, and uh, they're just not sick. And their, their serial conversion rates, despite uh, high prevalence of virus in the air, are, are relatively small. And so the species barrier is protecting man, at least for now. Now, that'll be totally a wash if the virus changes and becomes highly transmissible. But right now, if you look at some of the best data out there, the attack rates for infection are relatively small. And the good news, where we have had H7 and 9 infections, at least in China, their bivalent inactivated vaccines have seemingly stopped um, the high prevalence of H7 and 9 uh, in the poultry and uh, cross-species infections in man. So we seem to have an interventive tool. Where I think the problem is uh, that I'm most worried about with the influenza A, uh, the problem is in the pigs. And that's particularly true for North Carolina where we have uh, at least the number two pig um, state producing state. Uh, now, this has been a political problem in that the pork industry is very strong and when we've announced outbreaks of swine influenza in man, it's caused economic damage to the industry. So now we call these variant influenza viruses, but we've seen now uh, quite a few of these and they're hard to detect because in the hospital setting, you'll get a signal that it's an H1 or it's an H3 and it will stop there, but it very well may be a novel H1 or H3 that's reservoir in pigs. So we need new diagnostics to, di to distinguish these that could be used at the clinical level. We know that these viruses are crossing over and they're amazingly at a low um, uh, barrier because five months after, or several months after the first detections of the pandemic viruses in man, they were already in pigs. Um, and in this report, in our collaboration with Min University of Minnesota and the CDC, uh, we found quite a few of these. And subsequently, these human viruses have recombined or reassorted with various different viruses that were already circulating in the pigs. So you get re uh, progeny viruses that are unique. And now we've been able to study, as I mentioned through uh, an R01 uh, NIH grant, uh, these pig farms in China, uh, we've, we've done work in nine different farms, two different provinces, followed prospectively 300 pig workers and 100 controls, looked every month in the pigs and in the pig barns, and I'll just say we found a whole lot of mixing going on. So many, many opportunities for viruses from different uh, reservoirs uh, to mix in these settings, and it's very real, it's a very real threat. So I'm, I'm concerned about that because we do little to no surveillance of the viruses circulating in pigs. It's all passive, it's all uh, clinically based. Uh, if the, if the uh, industry thinks it's a big enough problem, they call them the veterinarian, the veterinarian then sends the assays in. We also see serologically extremely high risk for the workers. These are data that we uh, did in a cross-sectional study in 2006 with these very high odds ratios uh, for infection in the workers, but not only in the workers, but also their family members who had no direct exposure with pigs. So in contrast to the low odds ratios, the low risk for the other type of animal res reserved uh, pres uh, reservoir uh, viruses, the pig viruses, you know, are freely are uh, crossing over, at least the ones are reflected in these studies. And we're seeing a tremendous variety of these. These are data from the National Animal Disease Center uh, showing as of 2008, seven different genomic variants circulating in pigs. And these are due to incursions from viruses from humans and, and uh, avian species. Now there's at least 10 just in the US Midwest. In the EU, at least 23. But get this, in China, more than 70. 70 different genotypes. And so if you imagine that the probability for the right combination of the, of the genome uh, to cause the next pandemic um, is greater, with the more variants you have, you can see why I'm concerned. Because the surveillance in China and in other developing countries that are big producers is very poor. It's very superficial. It costs money. It's not a, pro it's not a production problem. It's not a pig problem. And yet we don't have a good handle on it. So we've talked a bit about this in various different 
editorials, uh, often in the professional journals. Uh, but it's really tragic because we know we've had at least three, perhaps four, of the last pandemics associated with viruses circulating in pigs, and we just don't have a, a good uh, surveillance systems. So I, I, I need to probably close here, but let me just advocate that uh, the surveillance is okay, I would say, for poultry. The risk is rather low, but we're doing more work in poultry. Certainly the industry is doing more surveillance. In contrast, the risk is very high, I would say, at the swine-human interface and very little surveillance being done. And a lot of probability that we're gonna get hit uh, over the head like we did perhaps with 2009 with a, with a virus that emerged from pigs. So in a summary slide here, Laura Borkenhagen and our group drafted this for visual uh, summary. Uh, the species barrier between canids and man with respect to influenza, I say it's pretty high. Also with equids, uh, with uh, feline species, uh, the, the species barrier perhaps is a little lower for poultry, but where the action is, in my mind, and where we have very poor surveillance, is that species barrier between pigs and man. Uh, and we need to be thinking about it. We need to find ways to work with the industry in a non-threatening way. Uh, some of the surveillance techniques that we have set up here have found incursions a week in advance before they even knew they had a novel virus or an outbreak in the pig barns. So somehow maybe we can uh, engage them in bringing in these new technologies to bear in a way that's not threatening to them. And in fact, it's uh, problem solving. So let me just summarize here by saying that in, uh, in response to modern complex problems like we've seen with emerging infectious diseases, drug resistant organisms and food safety, the One Health approach has uh, got a lot of traction and we need to be training professionals we need to be engaged in public health practice and in our research. And we need to find, again, non-threatening ways uh, to work with the agricultural industries because frankly, without their partnerships, I think One Health is gonna fail. Thank you very much.